It's unbelievable. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Andrews, and I am very glad to be here. I'm a very grateful member of the Worldwide Fellowship of the al -Anon Family Groups, which includes al -Ateen. And I just want to tell Rita, too, our problem does center in the mind, Rita. So, and I want to, because we think alike. Uh, and thank you, Jim, Rita, and the committee for inviting me, and thank you for hosting and setting up this. I know I've worked on a couple of conventions in St. Louis, and there's a lot of work, and, you know, so thank you from the people that, you know, make the coffee to set up the rooms and I want to thank the taper too so he doesn't do anything to this tape <laughs> and um <laughs> and I love your theme the road of happy destiny you know it's on page 164 of the big book and I hope I get to meet every, every one of you on this happy road of destiny and it's been quite a journey for me actually the one of my favorite sentences in the big book one of many is you know see to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others and that's really what has transpired in my life as a result of al -Anon. you know when I when I first came here I'm t I was you know best I can describe it angry lonely you know restless irritable and discontented I'm very much like an alcoholic. I just don't have the allergy, but I, I can tell you I definitely have the thinking. And um, it, I have 10 brothers and sisters, and um, it was a little like an army camp in my house. And, you know, we were all in competition with each other. And, you know, my parents didn't really have time for any of us. I mean, we never had a heart-to-heart -heart talk about anything. Um, There's just, you know, time was a big element. and. Um, my parents, like, their way of communicating really was yelling at us, you know, if they wanted something, you know, and sometimes I was called Martha or one of my sister's names, you know, they didn't know who was who, and, and I'm also, I'm the third oldest, so I'm kind of bossy, and, um, because, you know, you got to boss everybody around and, you know, take care of them, so you think. I thought I had the, you know, world on my shoulders, and, um, you know, I was innately born, I think, to look at always, like, I always wanted somebody else's life. You know, there was somebody in my class who was an only child, and I thought that would be, you know, very interesting, and certainly you'd have a lot of attention, and it was all that self-centered stuff that, you know, I was just part of me that I didn't know what to do with, but I just thought everything was kind of about me. And um, I know you'll find that very hard to believe, but... Um, <laughs> So, you know, I really didn't appreciate any of the gifts that my parents had given me. You know, they led their life by example. And um, today I see that. I didn't see that back then. And um, I guess that's God's grace bestowed on me, you know, his love and mercy to be able to give me a different perception today and a new pair of glasses, so to speak. And I want to tell you, too, what I, what I share here is my experience, strength, and hope. It's how it worked in my life. And um, so, you know, living in that family, we did, I always wanted to, like, play on a football team or baseball team and never got to do any of that but you know next door to us was um, my cousins and there were eight kids in that family so we always played football and we played basketball we played baseball we played all those games but it wasn't exactly where I wanted to play it and um but we you know and today I see the beauty you know I may not have this person in my life but certainly God has given me somebody else in my life you know that can help me and teach me and I believe there's so many teachers along the way you just have to recognize it and um, so um, and it, when I left my parents' home, you know, I, was, I think I was 18, almost 19 years old, and it wasn't because um, I wanted to really necessarily get away. I really wanted to do what I wanted to do and um, not follow any of their rules anymore. And um, one of the big resentments that I came into al with was, you know, that I had never gone to college, and I blamed that all on my parents, you see, because it was so easy. There was just such an easy target, you know. I didn't have any recovery, so it was always, you know, somebody did something to make me the way that I was. I did not take responsibility for my own actions. So I looked at them, and I said, you know, they never had a talk with me about, you know, that I could go to college. But, see, I knew everything, too. You know, so I thought I was going to be smarter than everybody else. And um, I went to this business school right after high school. And, um, and jobs were very, very plentiful when... Um, I went to that school, so it wasn't a matter of, you know, of getting, you know, it was just easy to get jobs, so I went to work in a law firm and um, had a good job and got an apartment shortly after that with one of my friends less than a mile away from my parents' home, and I would always go back home and do my laundry and pick up food, and, you know, my mom, she would always, you know, my mom loved to cook, cook three times a day. I don't know that she loved it, but she still, she does a lot of it, I can tell you that, and um, we had every berry tree that God ever made on our property, like blackberries, blueberries, we picked everything, cherries, apples, you name it, you know, and made all these fruit pies, and, 
you know, my mom taught me how to cook, and she always wanted to teach me how to sew, but I wasn't interested in sewing. And I think, darn, if I just would have done the opposite of what I wanted to do, I'd know how to sew today. And I can, I can still learn how to sew. But she had just so many gifts to share with me. And I, I always thought of her as um, like somebody's doormat. You know, she was all, this is, you know, I just, my memories of her when I was a kid is, you know, my dad would be sitting on a chair, and she would be tying his shoes. I thought, God, I hope I am never like that. And, um, and now today, you know, I, he, my dad had bad knees, you know, he had bad feet, he had bad everything. I mean, he, he worked seven days a week, and um, so he just, he wasn't home a lot, he wasn't available for us a lot. And, uh, but he, he had 11 kids, he was probably trying to, you know, um, raise a family. And um, we never went on vacation, and um, our, I shouldn't say never, our vacation was the Six Flags, and I always thought, oh, you know, and so I had all these dreams about how it was gonna be when I grew up someday, you know, and those dreams die hard and, you know, my expectations are, you know, I, I always feel disappointed when I have these dreams. And um, so, you know, I always thought, I'm going to marry somebody, a wonderful man with a, you know, house with a white picket fence and, you know, a couple of kids. And I think, who, today I think, who dreams that, you know? But, you know, as a kid, that's, that's what my dreams were, you know, that I would get married. So, Susan didn't define herself as that, but we are a go get him, in my opinion. Go get him. <laughs> and um, so that's, you know, later in life became my goal, you know, was to go get him. And um, I don't know who him was, but him surfaced. And, uh, and you know, that turned, you know, that's a, another story in and of itself. <laughs> but, um, so after, you know, when I lived in this apartment, uh, one night my roommate and I, it was, I think, a Thursday night, you know, we decided to have a party and she invited some friends over i invited some friends over i think we were about 19 years old and um so we and then when the next morning i got up and you know some i noticed somebody's laying on the couch as i'm running through the door because i got a good job you know i got my own car my own place and this guy's laying on the couch and he jumps up from the couch and asks for a ride to work and i thought that looked good to me you know somebody passed out on my sofa you know looked good to me that's just the place that i was and he wanted a ride to work and he was working at An anheuser-busch I, didn't, I can tell you this, I did, I did not even drive to work. I drove my car to the bus stop and took the bus to work. I work downtown, and um, the brewery is somewhat in that vicinity. But So, of course, you know, I wanted to be needed, so I drove him to work that day. And many days after that, I drove him to work. And, and then he brought his cousin along, who worked at the brewery, too, and I drove him to work. And um, so, because, like I said, I wanted to be needed. And... Um, that was the story of my life. And um, so that was the person I started dating. That is the person that is my husband today. And um, that was a rocky relationship, to say the least. And, um, and it didn't get much better. And um, even, even his dog was named Michelob. And, um, and uh, I can tell you this. That I'm sure he drank more of the profits at the brewery than the work that he gave them. And... Um, I remember one time when we got married that uh, the, the account, our accountant said to us, you know, 11, 12 tax return, I mean, 11, and t 11 to 12 W-2s, that's a little excessive, and, um, because that's how many jobs he'd usually have in the course of a year, and, um, and um, that didn't resonate with me, you know, it was like the elephant in the room, we never really talked about it, I did not know anything about alcoholism, you know, I knew he drank too much and he, he was the problem, I can tell you that, I easily identified the problem, and it was him. <laughs> And um, it was never me. I was never, ever, until I came into Allen, I'm able to look at myself. And um, so we dated for maybe a year and a half. And um, Jim, who is one of my dear friends and my husband's, he said I had to tell this story of one time we were, I think we went to um, Table Rock Lake, and I had never driven a stick ship my, ever in my life. And um, he was passed out. My husband passed out, and he could not drive, of course. So. You know, I drove that truck. It was this old truck, I think like a 67 Chevy something, and it was all banged up, you know, all those dents and whiskey dents all over the place. And um, I drove that home, never driving a stick in my life, and screamed and yelled the whole way home, you know, get up, it's time, you know, I can't do this anymore. And, uh, you know, I was just, I think I operated on rage for, you know, like three and a half hours. And we made it home, thanks to me, of course, you know. <laughs> and, and I will tell you, in our later, probably five or six years down the road, one day when he was gone out fishing, one of his favorite hobbies, out fishing, I decided to sell that truck. I had the title and advertised it and everywhere. And he went out fishing one day, and when he came home, that truck was gone. And um, so 
you know, I think uh, in anything I pretty much, you know, I say a lot of things I heard from somewhere else, and um, I think it's Mary Pearl that says, you know, if it's worth doing, do it till you die, you know. So it, it always stuck in my mind, I'm going to get him someday. You know, and I, kind of, I grew up with that attitude also, get even, you know, that mentality of don't get mad, get even, you know, and then you are a better person to get even. And um, always, you know, just compare and despair, you know, comparing myself to others, you know, but I was never good enough. And, you know, when I came into the doors of al -Anon, I had this big L on my forehead that, you know, I just felt like a loser. You know, I had, I really felt defeat after being in al -Anon for probably two or three years. You know, I felt like, you know, this, this isn't worth it. And, you know, actually, you know, that's probably when I had a surrender, you know, when I said, I, God, I can't do it anymore. Please take it all, you know can't handle it anymore and um but during our relationship when we dated you know I remember one valentine's day i got a half dozen roses and somebody else got the other half and i later found out about that so you know all those years you know and we didn't even date that long i can't say all those years but probably like a year year and a half i would just rather than confront him you know i would just stuff it all and then yell and scream i could not even communicate you know it's like you did this and now I'm angry you know I just it was always a cause and effect it was always my reaction you know that I couldn't figure out you know what was going wrong other than this nutcase you know that I was dating but you know I had to have him and it, it started it all started out wonderful I mean he's a great guy always smiled and um, always having fun and you know I grew up in a very serious home everything was you know we will follow the rules and can't leave the dinner table until you know everything's gone uh, all your food's gone and you know on Saturday we would like clean every cabinet in our house clean the refrigerator clean everything you know and it was very militant and you know so he was very exciting I mean I thought this guy would take me places you know that I always wanted to go and I never I did not know where I wanted to go I just knew where I was is where I you know didn't want to be because it's like no matter where you go there you are so very true and my sponsor used to always tell me you know if you always do what you always did you always get what you always got and I'm like oh crap I know that you know it's like but I need to be reminded of that and you know but I you know my sponsor is in my opinion sponsorship is probably one of the most important keys of the program because that is somebody that I'm accountable to and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that but um after um, Joe and I had gotten married, and now I did some family planning all by myself. I know that will come as a surprise to some, but you know, I kind of am a take charge person. So I decided the way to, that this guy is going to marry me is I'm going to get pregnant. And um, so that's what I did. I carried that plan out. I usually, you know, I don't like to admit defeat, so I'll okay, take it to the end. And um, so that's what I did. And never really seeing anything wrong with that, seeing if he would not keep cheating on me, I would not have to do this. That's, that's how I saw it, you know? I mean, I, like I said, I cannot tell you enough, I have a thinking impairment, my problem does center in the mind. And um, so um, we did get married and uh, I thought, you know, well, you know, my mom said, you know, with my culinary skills and my house cleaning, you know, she thought this, it would work out, you know, because he would appreciate that. And well, I mean, if nothing changes, nothing changes. I mean, I, you know, I remember one time I asked my parents to come over and please talk to him, you know, about his drinking and, you know, it didn't help. I mean, I tried a lot of things. I'd join him. I'd drink, I'd drink right with him, you know. Um, but, you know, I usually got sick or passed out when I drank. And, you know, when you lose that kind of control, it doesn't feel that good to me. And um, because I don't have, you know, I can't fix it or, you know, it was that I had met my match in alcoholism, too, because I just couldn't fix him. And then, you know. And I want to say thank you to, you know, the Alcoholics Anonymous and Bill Wilson and Bob Smith because those, I mean, in my opinion, I do have them on a pedestal. And I've seen that documentary and it's, you know, they, they are two human people. But, but, I mean, when Bill Wilson wrote that big book, you know, God must have moved his pen because it, that is an amazing, amazing book. And, you know, I thank Lois Wilson and, you know, Ann Smith be, for, for seeing that, you know, we could benefit from a program the similar to Alcoholics Anonymous in that the family needed help as well because it is a family disease and you know I, I think I was sick long before I met my husband so you know I cast no blame there it's you know it's all about looking at myself and what can I do differently and uh, my sponsor you know taught me from the very very beginning too this formula for living when I 
uh, work step six and seven, you know, say a prayer, you know, ask God for help and then listen, listen for his guidance, you know, don't you? And then the action that you take, whatever you take, do the opposite of what your thinking tells you to do or do the opposite of what you used to do. And that's always been a real good formula for me because I mean, I, what I used to do was just crazy. I mean, and, um, and, he, and she said, let God give you the results. You know, you have got to quit running that show. You know, she said, you are not the power. She said, you think you're the power, but you're not the power. And um, so, you know, and I realized that I had to step aside and, and, you know, and went on this really, this quest for God in my life when I started working with her. And um, so after being married for like seven years and my husband would go to this loot club that I didn't know what the heck a loot club was, but it's the Loyal Order of Turkeys. And that was real fitting for him. And, um, you know, and he usually just started a fight with me when he got home from work so he could go out and say, you know, um, it was because of everything that I did. And, um, you know, but if you met us, you know, people would say, you know, well, what the heck is wrong with her, you know, or what's her problem? You know, they thought he was a funny, good, you know, good guy, you know, and then they'd look at me, the crazy nut, you know, that he's with. No wonder he drank. You know, it's my, that's what my thinking was that they probably thought, you know, that, you know, so. And I just didn't, it was like a merry-go-round. I just did not know how to get off, did not know how. And um, so, you know, after we had been married seven years, his family uh, came to me and said that they wanted to do this intervention um, on for, their, for my husband's brother, not for my husband, just because they thought his, his brother had a drinking problem. I thought, whatever, didn't ask me to be part of it. They were just telling me about it. And um, so my husband came home that day and said, I think I have a drinking problem and I'm going to go get some help for it. And I thought, what the heck does that mean? And, um, and it meant he was going into this uh, Edgewood, it was a 30-day inpatient program at that time. And, um, and the first thing I thought of, now this is so sick, I thought, how is that going to make me look? You know, I was all about how is it going to make me look? And what, you know, I had all these questions. And, um, and then when he was gone for a couple of days, I'm like, oh, yes, this is, you know, peace peace and happiness and I thought I could I could really kind of get used to this until they told me in Edgewood that I needed to go to Al-Anon and I'm like I thought oh I, I'll go there to see you know I can maybe figure out how to keep him sober and um I didn't think it had anything to do with me I mean I'm still in the dark still sitting in that closet you know thinking there ain't nothing wrong with me and um so I went to, and they also invited me to go to family week for two weeks, but I was much too important for that and couldn't take off that time from work because God knows, you know, I didn't know what a vacation was. And um, so I passed on that and I started going to al but I was kind of just sat on the outskirts, you know, not really getting involved because I'm smarter than everybody. And um, I had that attitude and I, life is 99% attitude and that was mine. But I'll tell you, and then I did, I did get a sponsor after a short time. And it was somebody who like was my friend and you know I worked on a fourth step for maybe a year you know and then did a fifth step for maybe a year and so you know uh, after about three years you know I was going to a meeting with a friend of mine and um, I was going to a meeting and I listened to this lady and she would talk about God working in her life and that you know it, you know talk about more of God in her life and less of her and dying of self and I thought you know, that has something that never, I mean, I, I'm Catholic. I grew up, you know, for first eight years, eight years of my school life. You know, I went to school to church every day and went to mass. And, you know, but I always thought God was a punishing God, you know, that he punished the heck out of me all the time. I didn't know why. I thought I was such, you know, such, you know, a good person. And um, so, you know, that my, pers I made all these, pr you know, demands upon God, too. I never talked to God. I'd say, oh, God, please give me this. Please give me this radio for Christmas. And please, you know, give me, give me, give me, you know, and give me a couple kids and give me this. And, you know, and um, I, I learned, you know, God gives us free will. And he, you know, I never, I, I did not, it was like God was standing outside. And I never, ringing the doorbell, ringing the doorbell, and I never answered the door. And, you know, never invited him in. And so it was like my heart was just iced. My, it's just ice I felt like you know that I was just such a cold person and and so the night that I and it took a lot of courage for me to ask this lady to be my sponsor because you know I was so full of fear and um so that night I remember I had to stand in line because there were people waiting to talk to her and so person in front of me asked her to be her sponsor so I thought oh, 
no, I can't ask her. You know, she's all full. She's all full. You know, she doesn't have any more room on the dance card. That's it. It's all over. Go home. You know, cry on the way home. But I stayed there. Something in me said, just stay and ask. Ask her anyway. That's what you're going to do. Just ask her. So I asked her, and boy, did I regret that because she gave me this list of demands that, you know, I will call her every night and that we were going to read in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous the first 164 pages of the book because it was the directions on how to work the steps and then I would go to meetings and then I would also go to open AA meetings to learn about the disease so I thought geez you know I'm busy I'm a busy person I had three kids by then and um so um she was somebody that held me accountable you know and we and God gave me the time to call her every day you know we went through that book um, we went through the book line by line. I mean, my book so is falling apart. You know, it's broken probably in 10 different places. I've used my book so much, and it's written in um, everything, you know, all the notes. when we And I pa I've passed it on to many people that I sponsor in the same way that she sponsored me. And one night I was at work late. I was still working in a law firm, and I was there late, probably like 6.30, 7 o'clock, because we were reading in the book. And, um, and I left my book on top of the trash can before I went home and forgot it. And so the next day, you know, oh my God, I ran, I was looking for it frantically and I remembered, I left it there. So the cleaning people probably took it. And um, so I called, my, I called my sponsor and told her about it. And you know, within like a week, she had went out and bought me a book and wrote in all those notes because she had them, I mean, in her book because it was passed on to her. And you know, I was, you know, I thought, wow, that was how generous, you know, even though I thought she was kind of a harsh person. Um, now, other sponsees that she has, you know, it's like I always think she's harder on me than anybody else, but, you know, there again, that's a com compare and despair thing. And um, so, you know, I'm working along, and, and then one day my husband's sponsor had made a bet with him that, you know, unless we both started working our program, you know, that we would, he, oh, he bet him something, a steak dinner at the Bebo Mill or somewhere that, you know, unless we both worked our program that, you know, we weren't going to make it. So I don't like anybody telling me that, and um, I would show him that we were going to make it. And um, all these things, you know, like somebody told me in my meeting one time, you know, really, Mary, you're kind of a badass. But, you know, deep down, I, she said, I know you're, you have a, a soft heart and a warm heart, and that's very wow. true. And, um, and my heart started to melt, you know, as a result of some actions I, I took, you know, at the direction of my sponsor. And um, so... We started, you know, continued to work the steps with my sponsor, and, you know, it's kind of like we went in our own direction, you know, my husband and I, and then we came back together in a healthy way. And, um, and I, before I had done that, though, you know, I told my sponsor, I said, oh, this is just really, you know, this relationship, this is, you know, it started out crap, it's not much better, and, you know, I think, you know, we could just part our ways. And she said, you live with them this long, it's going to be, you're going to be in the program for one year, and then you can make your decision. And that was probably the most sound of advice you know somebody ever gave me because you know I changed you know I had changed deep down you know and, and how I felt and and um, you know and again that was the actions of this program and you know we decided to we would have date night once a week and you know we would go on a date and um, I really grew to like that and uh, except when he picked date nights you know a lot of times he's kind of you know like I said he likes fishing and hunting not hunting but he likes the outdoors type he likes to camp and um, so you know he'd want to go to a park or somewhere and I thought oh god you know and, and I like that too and um, you know and I know he didn't always like it was about compromise you know I learned how to compromise that you know I don't he doesn't have to be an uh, image or reflection of me he is his own person it's like what we learn here in Al-Anon, you know, we each have a voice, you know, and we can express it. Nobody's right, nobody's wrong. And that, you know, for you to have peace and happiness is an inside job. It has nothing to do, you know, with external, you know, nothing, no one is going to make me happy and no one's responsible for making me happy. And um, so it's like, and, you know, and when it came time to make amends, you know, I had, you know, before I made amends, my sponsor said that, you know, you need to change what you're doing otherwise you know you'll just be walking up to him saying I'm sorry and you probably said that to him a couple hundred times so what does it mean I want you to change your behavior toward him and and start treating him with respect and you know I thought oh god another one of her suggestions but I'll do it <laughs> and um what the heck is wrong with her I think so you know and she said have you ever told him thank you you know for what he because he mows the lawn he you know mister you know whatever I ask him to fix he'll fix and I said no it's because it's part of his job and um <laughs> and so 
one day, you know, I, I got out of the courage to tell him thank you for something, but it was, he was outside and there was a window between us. <laughs> and I told him, that's how I had to tell him thank you. And he goes, oh, did your sponsor tell you to say that? <laughs> yeah, you got it. She did. And um, so then, you know, once that relationship started to get better, um, you know, then my sponsor decided, you know, that I needed to really look at my job and how I was there. You know, was I, where, was I the best employee? Heck no. Heck no. Showed up on my terms, did whatever I wanted, basically. Because why? Again, I know better than everybody else. But I was working for this guy. He was about 6'5", an attorney. And um, I used to think, you know, he makes way too much money. I do most of the work. I answer all the interrogatories. I type them up. You know, if he needs lunch at the courthouse, I bring that to him, you know. But, you know, honestly, you know, if I'm standing in the middle of a courthouse, that's not going to make me an attorney, you know. It's like he, he went through, you know, he had that position, and I kind of, you know, I wanted what he had, and so to speak, but didn't want to go through, take any of the action to get what he had. So I was, I was disrespectful to him, you know, and, and he was gone a lot anyway. So, um really I could do you know like on the days he was gone do whatever and um but that wasn't you know doing that wasn't doing what I was supposed to do that's not what they hired me to do I mean there was plenty of work to do while he was gone I just you know took advantage of the situation and um so my sponsor I mean I didn't even get this guy a cup of coffee and this is how I came to know God is over a cup of coffee and you know my sponsor said you know I really need first she said you need to offer to get him a cup of coffee when he comes in in the morning oh, crap you know so you know I was, I mean, that morning, my hands were sweaty. I was sitting there, thinking, and then he is 6'5", coming down that hallway towards me, and he, he came up to me, and he said, good morning, Mary. I said, good morning, Bill, and he said, how are you this morning? Fine. I'm, Bill, can I get you a cup of coffee? He goes, well, yeah, that would be great. And um, so I said, well, Bill, how do you drink it? And he told me, so I, you know, ran off, got him a cup of coffee, brought it to him, hurried up, picked up the phone, told him, I did it, I did it. You know, I was so proud. I was like a five-year-old, you know. I did it. You know, something, I, I had no living skills. It's like when I came to Ellen, it was like, you know, 101, you know. And, um, and so, you know, and so I was very, you know, very excited about that. And so the next morning when Bill came in, stood in front of my desk, and he said, good morning, Mary. And he said, can I get you a cup of coffee? And just something about that, him asking me that, it was like God came to me and said, you know, you don't have to run the show anymore. I'm going to take care of you. You know, just sit back and, and um, do, what you need, you know, do what you need to do. And I had to surrender then, you know, that, like I said earlier, my, you know, what I'm doing isn't working. You know, my, you know, I turned my will and my life over to the care of God. And, you know, and my will is my thoughts and my life are my actions, you know, and before I ever take any action, you know, it's, it's in my thinking. And so I, I had to get that thinking in line. And, and so, you know, I know today, you know, my first thought is not my best thought. So I usually don't even express my first thought. I know that about myself. I'll just keep it to myself or, you know, and on a good day that those thoughts don't even pass through the system anymore. You know, they, they've left me. And, um, so maybe I hit the delete button and they'll all be gone someday. You know, it probably won't be that simple, but, you know, and I was ironing my clothes before I came here th this morning, and uh, and uh, I felt like the, the iron was kind of cold, so I was looking at it and looking around, and there's a reset button on it, and I thought, I hit that reset, of course it started working again, and um, I thought that's how life is, you know, we're given a daily reprieve, you know, that we get to keep coming back, you know, we don't have to remember everything, and we can have a do-over, you know, if I have an argument with somebody or if I have a, a bad day, I can, there's a process by which we can live, you know, and that's these steps, you know, I can make amends to that person. You know, and God willing, not repeat that. And um, I've had the opportunity to make, you know, some amends that have really changed me in my life as a result of doing that. I would have never done that without these 12 steps. You know, and that's why I'm just so grateful. You know, I have just so much gratitude. And I feel like I am full today. I feel like I am filled up. And, you know, I have something to pass on to others. And, you know, you know, I remember when I first started sponsoring people after I finished the 12 steps. And, all my, and then my sponsor said, you know, I'm him to go out and carry the message and I thought well, and I said well you know I, I don't want to screw anybody up or anything and um, she said well they were probably screwed up when they got here go on sponsor somebody <laughs> and uh, that, that's what you know I heard her say to me and um, so I used to call her all the time and she says Mary you're carrying the message not the person you know <laughs> let them do it that's our life just carry just put it out there carry the message you know so I would sit around out my backyard you know sometimes two or three people that I sponsored you know we'd be reading in the book and 
And, um, you know, one of my kids would come out and try and sell them something from the, you know, the fundraiser they were working on. And, uh, and you know, it's just, you know, it's like we are family today. And um, I'll never, you know, we used to, you know, when my husband was newly sober and when I was in recovery, we used to just get in the car on the weekend and, you know, we'd go to conventions all over, you know, like Mississippi. You know, we'd just drive there. You know, I just, and then when I walked in here, I thought, I'm at home. This is where I feel at home. This is my home. And, um, and you know, it's, I feel like you're my people. And um, I know we're all God's people and we're all God's kids. And I try and remember that today and, and not judge others. And um, sometimes, though, I feel like I'm in the swamp, you know, and I just need to, like, just pray more and, you know, take less action and, you know, try not to think and, um, and, you know, just live life, you know, as God would want me to live, you know, to be a maximum service to him, to carry this message, really. I mean, I think that's what my, our mission in life really is to, you know, work with others, you know, be of service to God, not to myself, you know, to others. And, um, so, you know, we went on in the program and, um, you know, life was getting really good. Like I said, you know, we were going to conventions all the time, and I'd, I'd come, it was just like spiritual intoxication to me, you know, when I would go to conventions and, and hear speakers and how it worked in their life. And I think, you know, so many tools in the program for us, you know, we have the steps. And, you know, and when I worked the steps, and I still, of course, like everybody, continue to work them, I feel like, you know, like when my sponsor told me everything I needed to do that first time, you know, I, I, and then I started doing it, it was like, the ego deflation that's what it felt like you know the ego like just kind of left me you know and i you know it's like i feel like i feel god's like god is my personal god today you know that god dwells within me and within us and that's to me that's personal and um so i want to be you know to me to be a successful person is to be a good person and, and to do what's right and there's this one of my coworkers at work she has a sign on her desk it says the road to success is always under construction and I just love that, you know, it's like, you know, I don't want to become stagnant here. I want to keep growing and continue to help others and continue to sponsor people. And, and you know, my husband does a lot of service work, and he always led that example for me. And um, one of my sponsees, like, many years ago, you know, would ask me, you know, well, what's, what's the IR, what's the GR? And, you know, so really that kind of inspired me to, you know, start getting into service and, and, and helping others and carrying the message that way as well, because it's, it's needed there too. And, you know, al just isn't in these four walls, you know, it's, it's, you know, out there is a bigger, you know, there's a world service office, just like there is an AA. And, and so there's just a lot to do. And it's like, God gives me my time. So, you know, I wanted to give that back to him too. And, you know, there's just so many people you meet along the way. And I feel like, you know, part of the program too is the support and the fellowship is part of the program. And, and most of all, though, I think al is it's a spiritual program. It's all spiritual. And, and that's really what I've learned here too. Is, you know, it's about having a relationship with God. And that allows me to have a relationship with others that, you know, has helped me tremendously. Because before I got here, I did not know how to have a relationship with others. You know, as a result of working these steps too, you know, one, one morning I decided, well, I had written this amends out. I, you know, I'd read it to my sponsor and she gave me the green light. So I, you know, ro drove up to my mom's one morning and made amends to her. Cause you know, I was the type of kid too. You know, I wouldn't come home at night when I was supposed to and always made up some lie, you know, like ran out of gas or something and you know, we didn't have, I, I didn't think about AAA then um, to come get me because there was really nobody to come get because I, I just lied. I was a good liar. And um, I haven't taken a drink yet. So let me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so, and I remember I, I'd come home like two, three o'clock in the morning. My mom would not go to sleep, you know, in her bed until the last kid was home. And um, she'd be on that couch, you know, it'd be, you know, saliva coming out of her mouth and you know like this I go, oh god I hope I never act like that you know that never happens to me and uh, guess what anyway so you know I, I talked to her and I said you know I've been working now on program and you know as a result of these steps you know I'm and but and then you know I talked about you know my side of the street and what I had done and um and I said you know god willing I you know I won't repeat I won't keep doing the same thing and in um my mom hugged me for the first time ever that I ever remember. And, you know, that was a, a spiritual experience for me and a defining moment that yet again, you know, God will take care of us. And I've had so many, so many moments like that, you know, that I'm just filled with gratitude, as I said. And, you know, 
I think gratitude is an action too. You know, it's like you can't keep it unless you give it away. So if you're filled up with something, you need to give it away. And I feel like I am filled up with, with God. And you know, a friend of mine, I went to a uh, service workshop. It wasn't a workshop. It's just a, it's a service speaker spoke at this. Um, it was for the Alano banquet. It was a fundraiser, and it was Harold L. And he spoke on service. And um, he said, and I could really relate to this. There are three kinds of people those who make it happen, those who watch it happen, and those who don't know what's happening. <laughs> and um, that, you know, it was like, I think I've been all three of those people, and, um, but I definitely like to make it happen and, um, because I think I have something to give, you know, and that only comes from God. It has nothing to do with me. It's, you know, what he's given me. And I think, you know, people that do service work, it comes from, you know, your sponsor and your sponsor talking about it. You know, I always talk to my sponsees about, you know, giving back, you know, in the way of sponsorship, you know, giving back in the way of making coffee, giving back, though, being an IR and a GR, you know, where there's so many positions available that, you know, al always, you know, they're always asking, you know, can you fill this? Can you do that? You know, there's been al board positions available for years in St. Louis. And finally, one day somebody called me. And all they had to do was ask me, I mean, would you like to run for a position on the board? And I said, yeah, you know, I'll do that. And um, they'll take a warm body. You know, nobody ran against me that day. <laughs> and um, so it's just me. And, uh, and um, so, so far, not much is going on. So I don't have to do anything. So sometimes, you know, you're just there. And, if, you know, um, I'm willing to do whatever is asked of me. It's just like, when, you know, when somebody asks me to do something, I can do it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. And Ellen and taught me that, too, to say yes. And um, last year, um, like in about, I think it was July or August of last year, my daughter, who has um her she has my grandson who is he was then about 12 years old i'm sorry 12 months old her husband was they live in seattle her husband was being deployed so he would be gone for eight to nine months and uh so she she was talking to me about you know should she come home to st louis or you know stay in seattle and try and get a teaching job and you know we talked about it and i just gave i answered her questions and gave her suggestions didn't say well really you should come home because you know we really miss you we don't get to see our grandson you know so i just you know i thought God, please give me the words, you know. So I just kindly talked to her, and, you know, a couple weeks later, she said, you know, we're going to put everything in storage in Seattle, and we're going to come home. I was like, yes, you know, how sweet it is. And, you know, I thank God right away. I said, thank you, God. And, you know, it's like I am not the greatest mom. You know, there's a lot to be learned. And um, so to have my little grandson that lived with us for nine months, he is just adorable. And I feel like that was God's way of giving me another chance, you know. And I watch her raise him, and she gives him choices. You know, he picks out what he wears, this kid, when he was 13 months old. You know, he's picking out what he's going to wear. And, you know, and it was one time, you know, he burned his hand on hot water. And I can tell you, I don't know if he's one of us, but that kid never touched hot water again. He knew. He knew after the first time. He didn't keep going back to see if it was going to be different, a second, third, fourth. He, you'd say that was hot, he would take his hand back, you know, didn't want anything to do with it. And um, he taught me a lot. And um, he really did. And um, so, you know, and my daughter would put him in time out occasionally. I mean, he's kind of a perfect child, so he didn't do a lot. But, um, but she would talk to him, and she would say, now that's not nice, and that is not following the rules when you do this. And she would put him in time out for like five minutes. And, you know, I thought about that. I thought, here, and he would come out after time out, and he would hug you and, you know, put his arms around you and just be as loving as possible. He didn't have a resentment, you know, that he had to go sit in time out for five minutes. You know, he was just as loving as could be. And um, so he just, I mean, and he, he would sit and he'd act like he, he put one book down after the other. He did just sit there and act like he was reading them or touch buttons or, you know, and then they would talk. And he just loved to do that all day. And they, they did something together every day. They, they had a support group they went to where, you know, it was kids and moms, you know, like in the same age where they had like a speaker come in one day and she was telling me one day they had a psychiatrist come in that was talking to that he had seven kids and um, they wouldn't be quiet at the dinner table one time. I can't imagine that. My dad used to say, who's causing all that commotion? And I thought, I don't know who. You only got 11 kids. But, um, and uh, he didn't like that commotion. And um, so the, he was the psychiatrist was trying to say something to his family and finally the seven-year-old said, everybody be quiet, the shrink has something to say, you know? And um, 
I, you know, we, I did not grow up with that sense of humor. So I love that in people. I mean, I wish I was a comedian, you know, but I'm just, so, you know, that seriousness always processes through my head. And um, it's God that gives me the humor in my life. And um, it's really all of you, you know, when you are able to share with us and, and tell us what it was like for you and what you did and what it's like today. I mean, I, I just, the, to me, that's everything. And, um, you know, it's when in 2000, the latter part of 2007, my dad went into the hospital uh, for something very minor uh, one day. And then, you know, it was like, and then they said he was dying, you know, and they had all these diagnoses and, you know, misdiagnosis and did all these tests. And, you know, I just kept praying to God. And, you know, I'd call one of my sponsees was a nurse and I'd call and ask, does this sound right? You know, they're saying this. And, you know, I can tell you this. Once again, I was powerless. I was powerless over what was going to happen to my dad. And, you know, I was right in there trying to fix it or at least try and understand it. And, you know, once again, you know, I invited God into my life and said, God, please help my dad, you know. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I know I have nothing to do with it, but, you know, if you could maybe make lighten his load or make his journey comfortable for him. And um, so, you know, in, in growing up, um, there's a lot of religious people in my family. My great uncle was a priest. I have, there are nuns on my mom's side, my dad's side. And on my dad's side, they have a reunion every year for, and since 1960. And like three or 400 people come to this reunion. And they say my great uncle, when he was alive, would say the rosary at every reunion. So my dad, my dad always says, says the rosary at least once a day. He said it, you know, for many, many years. And even when he'd go to take us to ch mass, you know, instead of listening to the mass, he'd be saying his rosary. And um, so on the ninth day that my dad was in the hospital, we were saying the rosary around his bed and he died, you know, as we were saying it. And I thought, thank you, God, because I knew, you know, he would pass safely in his journey and that, you know, maybe he had awoken to the paradise, you know, in his life because he too had a lot of struggles. But people helped me with that, you know, people in the program called me, sent me cards. It's like people taught me how to be here, you know, and today, you know, when somebody has somebody in the family who's sick or, you know, I go and, you know, offer help, support that person, whether they want it or not, I'll be right up in your face. You know, asking you if you know what I can do, and you know, I you know when somebody dies, you know, I go so, go support them and go to the visitation or go to the mass. You know, whatever I can do, I want to be there for others like they've been there for me. And um, and I can, just can't say enough. You know, thank you to everybody in these programs that you know that we all help one another. And I feel like you know, in my life, I am on round two that God, you know, continues to surround me with alcoholics. You know, our youngest son who is just 20 years old, you know, just he doesn't think he has a problem so therefore there is no problem and uh i was in a meeting one time you know where he did say he was an alcoholic and an addict and um my heart melted over again you know and i you know all this fear comes over me though when i think about him and he i do obsess about him i you know and i just it brings me closer to god you know because i keep praying you know and i know i'm powerless that's probably what i obsess about you know that i can't control this and um so um so i feel like you know once again i'm down in the swamp land but it's always better to be amongst people because you know i just want to fix him i don't want him to have to suffer and i project all this fear and you know fear is you know when i think when i am in fear about him it's future events appearing real you know why because number one he's not going to have a college education and that's what I want for all my kids. You know, the other two have one. And, you know, that's my, you know, like my hot button or my fear. You know, you're not, never going to get a good job, going to be under a bridge somewhere, going to have one felony after another, spend his life in jail. You know, I've just got it all predicted, you know, that he's going to be down and out because he does not want any help. He doesn't live with us. You know, he's not invited to live with us um, because of his actions. And, um, you know, still out there, still out there, you know, drinking and drugging said his life is good you know doesn't have a place to live right now but you know he says his life is great and um he blames me for a lot of his problems you know he was kicked out of college and it was because i didn't give him his adderall he said and uh, he also said that and he was he was in the harris house a treatment center for like two weeks and decided you know that he had a better way and the bottom line is he didn't want it and uh i mean these programs are for people that want them not he needs one but he doesn't want it and um so he's still out there and I continue to pray and I detach from him and I love him unconditionally. It's like a part of my heart went with him when, when all this, when he started, you know, when it really started to surface and, you know, 
talked about one day about killing himself and and you know it's like it's just not what I, you want for your kids and you know if he and I, I told him you know I said you know you would just have a much better life in AA or you know a 12-step program he said I am never going back there you know so I just pray for him and he said I am never gonna open that book again either and uh, a lot of nevers in there I told him and um, he doesn't take you know direction from me and you know I'm too I have realized too that I don't want to nag him anymore because it when I talk to him it's usually about all the bills that he has because he wants me to pay he has a credit card bill that you know he racked up in two months and he's not paying any of it because because he'll never get ahead he'll just all be paying interest or something and I'm like how do you charge and never think you're gonna pay for it but that's his mentality he just doesn't care and he has community service to serve and doesn't you know can't pay the fine so he just you know it's like he doesn't care and uh, so there's really you know other than prayers nothing I can do for him I would love to fix it and you know how I, I can fix it you know I could just write a check I could take care of all his problems but to me that is like putting him in his grave you know and I know I can't do that and it is so darn hard not to do it I just want to do it I just want to make it go away and that's not the solution here and it's like I know the solution I can tell you after all this al you think I could walk this walk I am you know I feel though I'm walking through it with dignity and grace as much as I can today. My sponsor says I'm enable, an, an enabler so to practice the opposite of doing what I want to do. So that's real clear, too, of what I need to do in this situation. So um, I thank you all for listening. And I want to close with this one page in a, our ODAT, al One Day at a Time book. It's a, a reading from Thomas Merton, and it says, the beginning of love is to let those we love be perfectly themselves and not to twist them to fit our own image. Otherwise, we love only the reflection of ourselves we find in the him, in them. Thomas Merton, no man is an island. I just think that's beautiful. Oh, thank you.